Good morning. It is 11 o'clock and I hope you are tuning in to have some Q&A with me with your cup of coffee. Um, a cup of coffee or cappuccino or tea or whatever you, your beverage of choice. And we are going to be chatting about the eight uh, pieces of the learning puzzle, but part two in dealing with what parents can do. So obviously, presumably, uh, this is a recording that I'm hoping parents will watch and be able to learn something from. And if they see that there are maybe some issues that they would like to bring to my attention and chat with me about, then that is what this um, Q&A session is all about. So I'm going to start by just reading from um, a book that I've based my um, eight pieces of the learning puzzle on, which is a book <coughs> called A Mind at a Time, written by Dr. Mel Levine. And I was very fortunate to have met the man myself uh, in 2008, you can see there. Um, solid, South African Association for Learning and Educational Differences. We brought him down to a conference in Cape Town and um, I had the pleasure of meeting him and um, he signed my book. And he really was somebody that I uh, did a lot of research about in terms of his um, neurodevelopmental profile that he um, writes about in terms of a child's learning and a child's brain and, and how children develop or not. Um, yeah, and, and really um, it was a very interesting sort of research paper for me to read because as a remedial therapist, you know, you look at children and, you, and they come to you because there are certain issues that they are struggling with at school and you've got to try and unpack and understand why um, these children struggle and, and how we, we can best help them. Um, so I, I just wanted to read a little bit from, from his book and why um, it, it's kind of so important that we, we, we realize that children um, are, are meant to be able to learn. They are meant to be able to grow and develop and, and succeed. So he says at the beginning, he says, it's taken for granted in adult society that we cannot all be generalists skilled in every area of learning and mastery. Nevertheless, we apply tremendous pressure on our children to be good at everything. Every day they are expected to shine in math, reading, writing, speaking, spelling, memorization, comprehension, problem solving, socialization, athletics, and following verbal directions. Few, if any, children can master all of these trades and none of us adults can. In one way or another, all minds have their, spe have their specialties and their frailties. So today we're talking about some frailties that children might have, and that this is why they struggle at school, for whatever reason. So right, let's jump in. If there are any, um, anybody, if there is anybody watching and you have um, a question for me, please pop it in the comments. Hopefully um, you, you, you've tuned in now um, and you're thinking about your child. And last week I spoke about taking the palm of your hand and placing your child at the center, your child in the palm of your hand. And this is what this, um, this Q&A session is all about. It's about your child, not, not anybody else's child, but your child. What is your child struggling with? If your child is struggling at school, if your child is struggling with anything that's learning related, why is that happening? So to start right at the beginning, we spoke about um, the eight pieces of the learning puzzle. And we need to be aware of the skills that children need in order to be successful in the classroom. We know that not every child is capable of A's for every single subject. That would be great, but it's not going to happen. It's very seldom that you get a child that's able to be exceptional in every area of their learning. So. If there's, if there's a, a particular challenge that your child might have, whether it's with reading or maths or writing or remembering or organizing themselves or planning, there's a reason why that is happening. And we speak about the eight tools, the eight learning tools 
that you you could potentially you know put together and say all right you know eight of these tools are working optimally or eight of these you know these tools are working at their at their best um but yet maybe one of them or two of them isn't working as well as the others and we need to know why so number one we spoke about the thinking with numbers being able to to navigate learn problem solve calculate understand recognize number and um, and if a child does not develop a concept of number or an understanding of number or quantity, there's a number blindness or there's a dyscalculia that might come into play. Now, this again is on a spectrum. You get some children who are very, very challenged in terms of numeracy and number concepts. And then there might be another area where they can do some, but they can't do others. So we look at the two types of number numeracy in terms of there's the numeracy that is mechanical. And in, in mechanical numeracy, we talk about the counting and the tables and bonds, the stuff that they need to just know out of their heads. So it's the memor memorization, I'm really struggling with that word today, memorization of um, calculating with numbers, bonds and tables. Now, when you're in art school, um, when we were at school, we had to learn our tables and that they, they, they just have to, we, we, we needed to just be able to recite them like that, off pat. Um, but unfortunately now, some children struggle to do that. They need to be able to count on their fingers. So when you say to them two times four, they've got to go um, two, four, six, they have to count in twos four times um, because they can't just know that out of their head. So the mechanical mathematics is the one side of things the other side of it is problem solving are they able to solve a word sum can they read a sum and then know what kind of operation is needed to be able to solve that sum um, now at home this is uh, what you can do at home uh, i would say you need to use objects around the house and get the children used to counting things real things not out of their heads not just being able to count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten but to actually physically count Ten things, ten potatoes, ten beads, ten counters. Um, we'll put, put some counters down and ask them to say how many do they think there are there. So put uh, 18 beans down and say, right, how many do you think? And there, they should be able to have some kind of idea. They should be able to guesstimate how many are there. If they're 18, they should be able to say, oh, maybe it's about 10 or 20, but not 100. Um, so there has to be some logic into how they guesstimate a uh, number. Um, so being able to uh, guess and then count and then compare. How many were you short or how many more did you need to have? Being able to write the number that they say. So if there's 18, can they write 18 or do they write 81? Is there a number reversal that happens? Is there an inversion that happens? There are all kinds of things that you need to observe when your child is working with you. It's very, very important if you're going to be doing um, homework with your child that they teach you how they are thinking and learning. You can learn a lot by just observing and watching how your child is, is working with numbers, words, any kind of work that they're doing. Um, it all tells a story and it's so important that you watch and observe and see. So we're talking about using objects that are lying around the house, being able to recognize numbers. When you're driving in the car, what's the number plate of the car in front of you? Do they know those numbers? Can they say a series? So if the number plate is 232, um, can they say that is 232? Um, or can they just say it's 232? Do they know that it's actually 250 and 2? So that place value, that concept of place value, do they know that? And you can use playing cards at home, just basic games like snap, um, being able to count the, the hearts or the clubs, um, being able to compare uh, a card with two clubs on it to a card with 10 clubs. Do they know that less and more and all those kind of things? You can do a lot with what you have at home. Uh, 100 grids, being able to count on an abacus, uh, using number charts, a ruler or a tape measure. Do they know how to measure? You know, again, be, a, be able to guesstimate um, how, how long do you think the side of this table is? Do you think it's two centimeters? Do you think it's 20 centimeters? Do you think it's 200 centimeters? 
being able to guesstimate and use logic. I mean, maths is all about logic and being able to identify and understand quantity. And um, for, for things on the computer that you can you know, engage your child with online work, um, Khan Academy is very, very good, K-H-A-N. It's free, you can register your child as a Khan Academy student. Um, it's all free and they can do, they can work their way starting at level one and working all the way up to, um, to a, a level where they are more competent. So it's important to grow your child's confidence when they're working with numbers because math anxiety is actually very real. And it comes, it, it comes like, a, like a thief in the night where a child actually starts to, to just, um, they, they almost get stage fright. Whenever they're faced with doing any work where there's numbers involved, they get stage fright. Um, the, the barrier comes down and, and they all of a sudden believe, I can't, I won't, I'll never be able to do math. Um, and that whole attitude towards numbers and working with numbers then becomes very negative. All right. So um, if your child needs um, extra math lessons, I would recommend um, something like Kit McGrath, um, Master Maths or Kumon Math. Look at those um, in terms of tutoring and extra math support after school. So here we, here we go, we've spoken about numeracy. I wonder if there are any questions out there in terms of how to help your child with numbers, with maths, and how to improve your child's number concept, um, attitude towards maths, and are they getting the right uh, support at school, and are you seeing those marks on the report, and when the report comes, what are the comments, what, are the, what is the teacher saying about your child's ability to work with maths? Those are all very important um, as well. So yes, um, let's move on to the next one, which is the mastering the challenges of reading. Um, here we spoke about children struggling to learn the individual letter sounds, the blends and sight words. So reading, is become, reading becomes very slow and um, methodical. They become, uh, they slow, it becomes tedious and then they struggle to comprehend because now they're not reading strings of words in, in, in terms of sentences and phrasing. They're just sort of blurting out words at a time. And so they don't have any train of thought when they're reading. Um, I want to just show you something. I've got this book here um, that speaks about the word, um, the phonics that they would start to learn. Okay, if you can see that, uh, it goes. The most common phonic words, starting with your a, e, e, a, a, and then b, k, d. Remember, it's not a, e, i. It's a, e, e, and q, r. You've got to know the phonic sounds. Then they start to blend the little words with the vowel in the middle. Your three-letter words with the vowels in the middle. Um, you then have to talk about the the digraphs. The, the, the beginning sounds, sm, sm, sl, and then eventually you talk, you, you, you do the ending sounds, um, which become at the end of the word. We talk about the magic, um, the magic E, which the magic E changes the vowel A and makes it A. It changes the E and makes it I. So pip becomes pipe, pin becomes pine, all those kind of things. Your vowel blends, U, A, A, E, E, and often the children um, sort of confuse the A, I sound with the A, Y sound. So they want to write train with A, Y, um, and the E, they, they confuse S, P, E, E, D. They want to write S, P, E, A, D. So they confuse those sounds because they sound the same. And um, so you can understand how confusing phonics actually is for children. And then the more difficult consonant groups, these are the ones that they sort of only start tackling in, in grade three, which is the PF sound, PH sound that sounds like F, the KN, the silent um, silent K, silent W, um, those ones there. Here we come right at the end now of grade three. Look in grade four, they don't learn spelling anymore. They've just got to know the spelling word. There's no, there's no phonics. And then the last one I want to show you are the 100 most common reading words. We call these the high frequency words. So 
So now I would suggest if your child is struggling with reading, I would say you need to make flashcards with all of these words and stick them up around the house. Because these are the words that they're going to need all the time. They can't sound these words out. They're not phonetic. They need to just recognize them and know them. These are what we call the sight words. Those need to be stuck up and they need to be seen every day. When they're brushing their teeth, stick the words on the mirror. So when they're brushing their teeth, they know the words. It's got to be a word that they recognize straight away. So if reading is slow and it's really becoming challenging for your child and they, they start to hate having to read, look, we, reading should really be something that they love doing. It should be a hobby. Um, if they see you read and you going and choosing books and they also want to be able to choose books and read, um, it's something that you want to nurture, you want to encourage them to be able to be reading. And obviously reading books that they enjoy. If a child doesn't like fantasy, they prefer the factual books, then go and find books about the subjects that they're interested in. That's what I would say as a parent is you need to first of all be modeling for them um, about reading. So whether you're reading on your phone, News 24, you constantly need to be empowering yourself with knowledge and reading. That is what we want for our children as well, to be able to choose something that they're interested in and read it. Um, so watch your child when they're reading. Do they struggle with the, the phonics? Do they struggle to sound out the word? Or do they struggle to recognize those sight words? Are they struggling to understand what they're reading about? So when they've read a page to you, if you ask them a question about what they've read, do they understand what, the, what, what, what was being said in that paragraph? Um, I would read to your children as well. Read to them and while you're reading, point as you're reading along. And every now and again, you know, you can stop at a word and say, hey, help me with this word. What, what is that word? And let's, let's try and identify the word together. Or you read a page, they read a page. It's all about the, the activity and the engagement with you while they're reading. If it really is becoming an issue and, you, and, and the child is not being able to grasp um, their basic phonics and sounds, then I would suggest you um, go to check their hearing, go to an audiologist, have their hearing tested. And if the audiologist finds nothing wrong and they feel that, okay, just a bit of speech might be what they're needing, then, then, then you go and do some speech. Um, but also another thing that, they, that you can do is a tip is when they're watching something on TV and you can add the subtitles, do that because then they are listening and watching as well. So subtitles on the TV is also a good idea. Um, and play, play rhyming games. So if you can play I spy with my little I, or um, you know, how many words can you think of that start with a brr and, and back and forth, you can play you say one, I say one, you say one, I say one, I say one. So as long as you're playing games, there are all kinds of things that you can encourage children in, in being able to do. Um, Jackie, yes, hi, please could you post the name of the book? Um, are you referring to um, this book, A Mind at a Time? That one, um, or there was this one. I've had this for donkey's years. Um, this was my remedial teaching uh, manual, <laughs> a practical guide for class teachers and students. Um, it was written in 1992, uh, uh, 1982, I like. 1982 it was published. And so I'm sure there are better ones out there than that one. But um, yeah, it, it helped me a lot when I was a student. My nephew struggles with recognizing the start and end of the words, like with words he will say it starts with S instead of W. So again, um, have you checked his hearing, Jackie? Are you, are you, uh, is he hearing properly? Because that would be the first um, thing, is to make sure that what he's hearing you know, is correct. Some children struggle to distinguish between certain sounds. If their hearing is muffled, so there might be a bit of wax build up in the ear, so they struggle to hear the beginning sound, especially the P, t, um, those sounds they, they will mix up. So just so just check um, the hearing. That has to always be something that, especially with with kids, you know, uh, in foundation phase, um, under the age of nine, I would say they should be having a hearing test. Um, especially if they have seasonal allergies um, and they might struggle with sinus. Um, if their ears are blocked, they are going to struggle to to hear. Uh, yes. So Jackie, that is the the name of the book remedial teaching. I don't even know if it's still available anymore. But um, I was using it a lot when I was remedial, um, when I was doing my, my remedial. All right, so let's carry on. The getting thoughts on paper, that was number three. 
with where children struggle to use their imagination and uh, write creative stories. They, they struggle to organize their thoughts. They struggle to think and plan um, and think ahead, being able to uh, originate something, think, think something you know, for the first time, so make up their own stories. And here again, they would need to be able to write, spell, read um, in order to do that properly. So it's not just a matter of, yes, I can think up a story and I can tell you a lovely story, but am I able to translate that story into words? And ob obviously punctuation then, they also need to be able to punctuate that story. Um, especially the older they get, they're having to write long essays, you know, 500 word essays with, with perfect spelling and perfect punctuation. So um, it's important that they are able to identify the punctuation marks, the language rules, all those come into play. So what parents can do in terms of that is encourage your children to tell you a story. So if they've watched a movie, um, let them tell it back to you and say, I want the beginning, I want the middle, and I want the ending. So I don't just want a story. I want you to say to me, okay, you know, how did it start? That's the beginning part. And now the middle part is what's the actual plot and what actually happened, and then how did it end? They've always got to be able to sandwich it together, slice of bread, the filling of the sandwich, and then the end, uh, the, 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 the other piece of bread. Um, so yeah, how did the how did the movie? You know, how was the movie? Are they able to tell you the story? And then um, ask them to to write down maybe the best part of the story for you. So what was the you know something from the movie that they are able to write down? Uh, do you think that the hero was a good person, and why? You know, being able to think. Again, their own thoughts, not something that they have watched or seen or, or um, copied, but something of their own that they think, their opinion. These are all higher order thinking skills that children are going to need the older they get. How do you think the story could have ended differently? Or uh, if you were the director of the movie, how would you have wanted the movie to end? You know, it's, it's those kind of creative thinking uh, skills that we want to nurture with the children. Um, if they really, really struggle to generate those ideas, use a storyboard. So a storyboard would mean um, five, five blocks, and each block um, represents a certain part of the movie. So they've actually got to draw the story out and then put those pictures in the right order, starting at the beginning and then what happened next and what happened next and what happened next. So it doesn't just become a jumbled mess. There is actually a sequence involved with the, with the movie or the story or whatever they are narrating back to you. So sequence pictures, very, very important as well. If you've got sequence pictures, um, that is, for example, um, we talk about the sequence of, let's say, a bean, a bean that's growing. So the first picture would be the little dry bean. The next picture would be um, the bean in the soil. Um, the next picture might be the water, the watering can with the sun. The next picture would be the little stem popping out of the ground with a leaf. And the last picture would be this beautiful bean plant. Um, so that's the sequence. So are they able to put those sequence pictures in order from beginning to end? And then can they tell you the sequence correctly using the correct language, the correct verbs, the correct um, uh, vocabulary? And then last step would be can they write those sentences for each picture correctly um, and, and using the right punctuation at the beginning? A capital letter, full stop, those kind of things. So these are all very, very important language skills that um, children are going to need to be all, to be able to cope in the classroom. Right, I'm going to stop there and see if there are any further questions coming to me. Um, okay, Jackie, I had someone tell me about the different color lenses for dyslexia. What is your opinion on these? I don't know about lenses, Jackie, but I do know that um, putting uh, using different color paper definitely does help with um, kids with learning uh, with, with um, dyslexia. The lenses would more or less do the same kind of thing, but um, I don't know. You'd have to see which color the child prefers. So there's generally a color um, palette that they use. It's pale yellow, pink, blue, green. It's normally the pale pastel colors. And they, um, they've tested children in looking at um, words using those lenses and then which words are the children eas um, more easily able to recognize. Um, but again, that's, that's lenses. I've, I've had success in just typing out or using different color. Instead of the normal 
you know, white paper, rather putting it on yellow or, you know, pink or, or, or change, change the colors according to, to whatever the work the child is being presented with. So I have heard that, that there are lenses that the children can use, but um, again, you'd have to chat to an optometrist and get more information on that. And if you're wanting an optometrist who specializes in dyslexia and treating children with dyslexia, you can um, let me know, I can send you the names of those um, optometrists. I don't know where you are, Jackie. Um, there are ones in PE that I know of. I'm not too sure of the other areas in South Africa. Right. Acquiring motor mastery, that's number four. Um, and here we talk about being able to use a pen and a pencil and a pair of scissors and a crayon and print. Um, all those things that children need to do in the classroom using their hands and their fine motor, their fine motor muscles. So if a child struggles to hold a pencil and manipulate a pencil, he's really, really going to struggle when it comes to writing long essays and being able to answer questions in an exam in, in time and all those um, challenges. So we spoke last week about the correct grip um, and using, um, a, what do you call it, um, a pencil, pencil grip um, that you can slide onto a pencil that forces them to hold the pencil correctly. Um, I know that occupational therapists also do a lot in terms of getting children to manipulate and use their fine motor skills. Um, practicing practicing their fine motor skills properly. So pa uh, parents, what you can do is just practice, practice, practice at home. So giving them things to do, like being able to pick up things with a pair, pair of tweezers. Um, we sp speak about uh, getting plasticine and rolling plasticine in your in your fingers like this or Play-Doh so that they strengthen these muscles and then moving, moving the plasticine around. You know, this is called finger dexterity. Dexterity, being able to use the fine motor, the fine motor muscles properly. Um, so being able to use tweezers to pick up beans, using a pegboard, um, being able to manipulate a puzzle when they're building puzzles, threading especially, um, can they thread beads onto a piece of string? All those kind of things are very are very important to in, encourage the fine motor skills development. And then if they're really struggling and you've spoken to the teacher and the teacher's concerned, go to an occupational therapist and, and um, get that assessed. I also wanted to say that um, going back a little bit to um, the reading side of things, that uh, October is actually ADHD and Dyslexia Awareness Month. So um, it's an opportunity if you do suspect that your child might have dyslexia. Um, I can also pop in the comments somebody who does dyslexia assessments and um, they can tell you if your child is dyslexic, what kind of dyslexic they are because there are different types of dyslexia as well. Right, so getting back to number five, understanding, producing, and communicating ideas. There, um, it's again being able to think originally, create your own thoughts, um, and being able to put those ideas down for somebody else to assess or evaluate for you. Oftentimes, the student understands and learns the work for an exam, so you'll say, he, he knew the work, we went over the work yesterday, he knew the work, but he bombed out in the test. So again, the child struggles to organize the thoughts. So the thoughts or the memory or the information is in the brain, but it hasn't been organized properly. So there's no storage, there's no silo for that information to be stored. It hasn't been categorized. Uh, and, and so the, the information gets lost in the brain. So... Here you, you need to make sure that the child is also able to write enough to earn the mark that's allocated. So for, a, for an exam or a test, if it's a 10 mark question, they need to be writing enough for 10 marks. They won't get 10 marks for a one, you know, a one sentence answer. So there again, it's very, very important that you have identified that that is what the child challenge, that, that's what the child's um, challenge is, is being able to retain and uh, being able to bring them the, the, the information that they learned back out onto the piece of paper for an exam or out onto the test. So sequential ordering. This is important where you are wanting your child to be able to follow a recipe or learn a cell phone number or follow directions to go somewhere. They need to start at a, at a point and then go to the next point and go to the next point. So there's an ordering, a sequence of events that needs to take place. The rules of a game. Can they understand and explain to somebody else how a game works? 
are they able to put those thoughts and explanations in a correct and logical sequence? Um, being able to explain the steps in a, in a science experiment, for example. So what is the first thing you do? And then what is the next thing? And how will it end? Sequence and steps and ordering correct logical progression is what comes into play here. Uh, being able to read a story and then answer the questions again and knowing what they are being asked to do with a story set. So um, again, this is your math literacy or your paper C where there's a problem to be solved, there's a long story, and then I must understand, okay, this is, um, this is where I need to add the things together or I need to take away the numbers from each other or, or whatever. Right, any questions on, on this point? We are just on halfway. Um, we've just got two more steps to go. We were on uh, five and there's two more to go. Getting thoughts on paper, getting organized and good work habits and learning to relate to others. There's three more to go. Are there any more questions out, um, out there? Um, perhaps you'd like to email me. Maybe there's some questions you want to email me. Uh, you're also more than welcome to do that. There's my email address and we can certainly chat more about your individual needs. But this is my 11 o'clock every day, every Wednesday, sorry, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, I'm going to be doing Q&A. I will choose something and I will just um, talk about it and if hopefully it's, if it's useful for you um, and you can share with others as well. Um, I didn't actually introduce myself, but I'll do that at the end if I remember. Um, yes, okay, so we're moving on to getting thoughts on paper. So getting thoughts on paper is in terms of struggling to use the imagination and to create stories from, um, from ideas. Um, again, they've got to be able to punctuate, they've got to be able to spell, they've got to be able to use uh, language rules, they've got to be able to articulate in words. So it's not just about being able to generate those creative ideas, but it's to be able to put them down on paper so that the reader can understand what you're trying to say. Very, very important skill that children do struggle with. Right, what parents can do. <clears throat> so in terms of being able to read your, your, your children's um, work or make sure that when you're doing homework together or whatever that you've watched, you've read what they've, what they've um, read, read what they've written. And if it makes sense to you, it will make sense to the reader. So you've all, always got to be um, the, I suppose, uh, the editor. Um, we always talk about you mustn't do the work for your kids, but you must be able to edit it with them. So in, in order to be able to correct what, what is wrong and explain to them why it's wrong and then that they, they can correct it. Um, we don't want you to be doing the work for your child, but it's important that you are part of the process. So when they're doing their homework, you're assisting the teacher, you're not teaching the, the, you're not teaching the work, but you're certainly helping them to understand um, the, the work that they've learned at school. Right, number um, number six, getting organized and good work habits. So this is where it comes, it really comes down to how organized your child is. How's their time management? Do they procrastinate when it comes to having to do um, an assignment or a project? Do they lose their things? So they always forget something at school or something at home. And um, they're not prepared. They, you know, they're just all over the place and, and it's very difficult to, um, to try and get them to be organized long enough or to sit still long enough for them to plan what they need to do in order to submit an assignment or complete a task or learn, even learn for a test. Um, they still need to be organized up to a point. Um, so here, um, <clears throat> what parents can do in terms of getting your child organized or being able to be having a better management of their time is you need to set time limits. So. Um, they need to understand the quantity of time. So they must understand how long 10 seconds is, how long 10 minutes is, and how long 10 hours is. So break it down into those kind of concepts, an hour, a minute, and a second. Can you brush your teeth in a second? No. But can you brush your teeth in 10 minutes? Yes. So understand how um, time is, is, I suppose, broken up into hours, minutes, seconds. And always use an analog watch. Uh, it's very easy to just convert to digital. But I think an analog, you can always go to digital later. But analog is always a good place to start because you can divide the hour up then. 
you're able to divide the hour on the clock into half, quarter, and it makes sense. Whereas if it's a digital, they don't have an idea of how an hour looks on a clock. Um, so it's very important that you that you show them in terms of um, the watch, the clock, the hands going around, the small hand, the big hand, and what each represents. Uh, use an egg timer. You can say, right, um, I'm setting an egg timer. Go and brush your teeth. How long do you think you're going to take? Um, and they can sort of guess, well, I'm going to take three minutes or I'm going to take 30 seconds. So discuss those kind of things with your children. And um, also teach them songs about the, the alphabet and about time. You know, if there are songs on the internet that you can teach them, teach, teach it to them, the days of the week. These are all sort of things that they're going to need. And kids actually struggle to, to recite the months of the year or to know what month we're in um, because it's far and they don't know. So have a, have a calendar up and, and always refer back to the calendar. You know, we're in October. Look, there's October. What comes after October? What comes before October? Uh, what's what you know? What's coming next? What's the next month? Those kind of things are important to visually represent time. Um, so teaching them about planners, songs about the time and alphabet, days of the week. Try and keep their workspace tidy and organized, and prepare for projects, features, and assignments. Okay, so here I'm going to give you um, seven steps in how to broach an assignment or a project. So it's a big chunk of work, or let's talk about tests. We're coming up to tests, test week, um, and you now need your child to be able to uh, study the whole term's work and be able to go in the next day and write, write the exam. So of course, procrastination is, is the worst enemy because procrastination means um, I don't want to, I can't, so I'm gonna put it off and put it off and put it off until it's too late. Um, and, and then obviously it is too late because now it's the day of the test and they haven't studied. So the way I look at it is, is how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So they just see the elephant. They don't see the fact that actually I can do this. I can break it down into small, easy steps. So step one is you've got to brainstorm. So there is what, what is your exam about? Okay, what are some of the headings that you can think of from your textbook? So what have you, what have you learned in that subject? So the subject is, let's say, uh, the subject is uh, natural science. Okay, term three, natural science. Give me some ideas of what you've learned about in natural science. So you just brainstorm a couple of topics or a couple of, a couple of concepts that they can remember and write them down. Then you gather information about those things. So you say, okay, now where, you told me about weather. Okay, where does weather come in? What chapter were you learning about weather? Let's go back and find the chapter about weather. You told me about temperature. Let's go back and find where were you learning about temperature. So from here, from these little thoughts in their head, you're now going to take it down to and find the work in the book. And you could gather, so first you brainstorm, then you gather your information. Then you decide, okay, is how am I going to present this work? So if it's, if it's a test, I'm going to present it by answering questions on a question paper. If it's a project, I'm going to do a poster or I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation. So however they want to present it, that's got to be step three. So first you're going to brainstorm what is the topic about. The second thing you're going to gather your information. What do you need to find? Where, where do you need to get your information from? Three, how are you going to present what you know? And number four, you're going to write those keywords down. Write as many keywords as you can think of that are already in your head. These are not new words, it's keywords. So let's brainstorm how many concepts you can think of from your natural science that you've learned this term. Just throw them down, write them on a whiteboard or make flashcards or whatever. Put them down in front of you. All right, now I've got keywords. Now let's find a sentence that relates to that keyword. So if it's temperature, tell me a sentence about temperature that relates to your work. Go back to your book, find me a sentence that has to do with temperature and let's chat about that concept in context, in the correct context, all right? Not I've got a temperature, I feel sick, I've got a temperature. No, that's got nothing to do with weather. So it's got to be in the right context. Then you've got to um, obviously now make a heading or decide how we're going to represent those keywords. So what's the heading of my, of my chunk of work? The keywords are down there with my sentences that I've decided I'm going to include. And then I'm going to either brainstorm and do a mind map or I'm going to make a list or I'm going to draw a diagram or I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation or I'm going to... Um, 
do a poster. So you're deciding now the layout. What is it going to look like? How is it going to be put onto that piece of paper or onto that slideshow or whatever? So there's got to be a visual representation of the work now. The final step is now actually going through it all, finishing it off, decorating it if it's a poster, putting it up, or putting in the other stuff. So if there's an exam or test and the work is on natural science, they are my keywords, they are my sentences, but from the sentences I might need to add more. So let me make a summary about that specific topic. And I make a summary. I can put it on a keyword, keyword on the front and the summary at the back. Those are the things that I'm going to use when I'm studying. Maybe I don't want to go to a textbook and have to read through reams and reams and reams of paper or reams and reams of, of, of work. I'd rather do it from what I know and then flesh out from what I gather from the book. So it's however your child learns best. If your child is somebody that prefers to write lists and summaries, great. If your child is somebody who prefers to draw and di uh, do something in a diagram or a mind map, great. It's what your child uses and how they learn best. Remember, not every single mind thinks the same. The last one is learning to relate to others. So this is the last piece of the puzzle. We talk about children who struggle to make friendships at school. They get drawn into all the drama. There's always something going on. They are either the victim of bullying or they are the bully. Um, they misread social cues. They just generally are miserable when it comes to social relationships, maintaining friendships, making new friends, being um, included in um, being invited to parties, or they are they really struggle to be part of a group. Um, and so in terms of what you can do, I think in terms of what you can do, you can't fight their battles for them. Um, too many times parents try and fight the battle for the child. They get involved with the other parent if there's a bullying incident, or they go storming into the school wanting to, to confront the child, the other child will confront the teacher that was mean, or take it to the principal, and there's a huge big hoo-ha um, with the child in the center. And I really don't think this is useful. I think as parents, we need to listen. There's always going to be both two sides to every story. So you need to listen to your child's side, and then you need to go to the school, or contact the teacher, and let the teacher find out the other side of the story and put the two together and come to a logical conclusion. Because generally, there are, it takes two to tango. We know that. And no child is an angel, so there's always going to be another side to the story. So even as a parent, we want to protect our children, and we want to mollycoddle, and we want to do everything for them. But actually, it's not doing them any kind of any kind of service in the long run. So we can listen, we can give advice, um, we can provide social tutorials. So we can talk about when I was at school and this is what happened to me, and it can be a teaching uh, and a learning experience for them. You can inform the school if there's a report of bullying or if there's something that you've become aware of. You can inform the school and ask them to find out more for you. Um, don't take matters into your own hands, as I said. Uh, find other kids who might have be a witness or, or might have uh, similar ho hobbies and interests to your child so that they can then birds of a feather flock together. We know this. So find other children who would share a similar hobby or interest to your child and create a friendship circle there. And if it's really, really bad and your child is developing severe anxiety and um, depression or withdrawal from, from issues at school, do go and see the school counsellor if the school has one or go and speak to somebody, um, a private practitioner, who can assist uh, with, your, with your child's social issues. Right, so that's the story. Those are the eight pieces of the learning puzzle. So I'll quickly go through them quick, quick. Number one was thinking with numbers. Number two was mastering the challenges of reading. Number three was getting thoughts down on paper. Number four was developing control over attention. Number five was acquiring motor mastery. Number six, understanding, producing, and communicating ideas. Number seven, getting organized and good work habits. And number eight, learning to relate to others. What I neglected to show you, as we spoke, we spoke about getting organized. Okay, I'm going to show you another picture. Can you see that calendar? Okay, it's a Monday to Friday, um, and it's what they would need to take to school every day. Um, and then after school, you've got a, a little schedule there. Okay, first lunch, and then homework, and then playtime, and then soccer, and then there's bath time, supper time, 
games and activities, and remember to pack for the next day, PT and clothing. Okay, then on a Tuesday, so every day it's literally organized. If your child likes this kind of thing, by all means, okay, you might feel better to have it all scheduled like this. It helps with, especially if you are a bit disorganized yourself, it helps a lot to do something like that. And then my last thing I want to show you quickly is the Ultimate Homework Diary. Okay, have a look at this. Okay. Oh, there. Okay, so what you've got there is a flip file. Okay, that is on a desk where your child's going to be doing the homework. So you'll see everything in this um, book is work that they need to be doing for homework. So that's their homework book with all worksheets and whatever that might need to be done for that day. Then you've got a plastic folder that's got their stationery, maybe a thing of tissues, and then the work that is written down. So the homework diary page. Okay, so what you can do is take the work from the diary, pop it onto that page. It actually looks like this. I can show you a bigger picture of it here. Okay, looks like that. Okay, so the subject, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, parent signature, what they need to take to school perhaps, what they need to bring home, if there are any assignments for the week, when it's due, okay, how's that? And tests, if there are any tests due. So, so one page for the week, that goes in that flip file. And then you can plan accordingly exactly what they need to be doing for the week. Okay, so there it is again. Looks like that. That's the page that you've basically taken the work from the diary. Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards here. The work from the diary that has been written in at school, you transfer the work onto this piece of paper. Okay, and then all the whatever they need for homework is in that file. So if they've left something at school, it doesn't matter because you've got stationery at home. You've got paper at home. Everything should be at home. So they won't need to always remember to take stationery from school home. You need to have work, um, something for them at home to do, something for them to use at home. So, chaps, that's all from me. Um, I hope you found this useful. Next week, if I do part three, it's going to be what teachers can do. So we've spoken about the eight pieces of the learning puzzle what teachers can do, uh, what parents can do, and now next week I'm going to do what teachers can do. So by all means, tune in if you find if you found this useful. Um, please email me if you've got any questions. My name is Philippa Fabry. I'm an education consultant here in Port Elizabeth, and I'm wanting to help parents with any school-related issues. Um, so my, my goal is to connect with as many parents as possible in, a, in as many forums as possible uh, to try and assist parents as much as I can. Um, there are Facebook groups that I've joined. One's called The Village, another one's called The Learning Parents, another one is called British um, Homeschoolers Group. Um, there's a group for, for uh, parents of children with special needs. There's an ADHD support group. These are all groups that I've joined because I simply want to hear what issues parents are dealing with out there so I can be of use. So by all means, please share this information with others. Um, invite other people to join our um, our Wednesday session at 11 o'clock. Um, I'm more than, than, than happy to, um, to engage with you. Lindine, thank you, very informative. I am so glad you found it helpful. Um, I did see that I had a few people watching, so I'm glad that I could help. Please share this video with others who might find it helpful. And um, yeah, Diarise Wednesday at 11 o'clock. This is my, my consultation hour. Um, it's free and anybody can, can use me, I'm here. So um, thank you for watching and I will see you next week. All the best. Bye-bye.